Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the Canadian Open Data Society's summer webinar. Um, my name is uh, Paul Connor. I'm executive director. And as you see from the screen, uh, this is going to be uh, previews of the upcoming 2021 Canadian Open Data Summit. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, just going to, here we go. Uh, we have a standard disclaimer here, uh, but I'm sure we're all friends, so uh, no worries about that. Uh, but just introduce the society here. Um, we started actually uh, last year. It's almost a year now, right, Richard, that we've been in uh, operation. And uh, it was another year before that we were preparing. Uh, as, as Connie well knows, uh, she and I were integral parts of the 2018 uh, Canadian Open Data Summit, uh, which uh, decided that we should uh, actually start a permanent uh, corporate operation. So you see our vision and mission here and our uh, value proposition to members. So I will be pitching to everybody on the call, Canadian or otherwise, uh, to uh, consider joining us and supporting our work. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Richard. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, so hello and welcome uh, to the summer webinar for the Canadian Open Data Society. Um, and it's taking place on September 15th to the, uh, September 16th. Et aussi, uh, c'est un événement qui va être bilingue. Alors, je vais, uh, je vais, cette session va être bilingue as much as it's going to be French and English, as is the summit. Et uh, mon nom c'est Richard Pietro, je suis le directeur de communication pour la commun communauté canadienne des données ouvertes. Et le maître de cérémonie pour le summit. I am, my name is Richard Pietro, and I am the director of communications to the Canadian Open Data Society and a master or the master of ceremonies for the summit. Alors aujourd'hui, on est heureux de présenter des sneak peeks pour les présenteurs et les sessions qui seront uh, qui sont en train d'être confirmées pour le summit. Uh, today, we're happy to provide sneak peek previews of some of the presenters and sessions that are being confirmed right now for the 2021 summit. Chaque présenteur auront environ entre deux et trois minutes chacun pour expliquer uh, et faire la promotion de leur session. Uh, each presenter will have about two to three minutes to promote and explain their session. Um, un point important à souligner, c'est que ce webinaire à ce moment est enregistré. C'est parce qu'on plan d'utiliser les clips de vidéo pour faire des promotions additionnelles en ligne. On va aussi demander à chaque présenteur de faire comme un petit elevator pitch de 30 secondes. Alors, um, so it's important to mention at this time that the webinar is being recorded and that's because we plan on using video clips to promote the summit online and the sessions online. And we're also going to be asking the presenters to do a quick 30 second elevator pitch. Um, on va prendre des questions, une couple de questions ici puis là pour chaque présenteur quand ils ont fini. Et à la fin du, uh, de notre session, Paul Connor va dire un couple de mots à propos uh, de la société. So we'll be able to take a few questions after each preview uh, are completed. And Paul Connor, uh, the executive director of the Canadian Open Data Society, is going to say a few words about the organization and how the summit is shaping up. So without further ado, we're going to dive right in into the session. On va commencer par les teaser à ce moment. Alors, um, Je vais demander, est-ce qu'on a Alessandro? Do we have Alessandro Alicia here to talk about their session? I don't believe we do. I don't believe he signed online yet, uh, but I do expect him. So next then, uh, I'm going to ask Micah Blom, uh, the CEO for the Open Data Company, to talk about her session. And uh, Micah, if you would be so kind to, um, to turn on your video, if you can. And, um, and trigger the Zoom camera by making some noise before you actually do your 30 second elevator pitch. Is oh. that so hard? <laughs> okay, I'm making some noise. Uh, so my name is uh, Micah Blom. I'm the CEO of the Open Data Company. And we believe strongly in the importance of transparency for the international development aid sector. For that purpose, we have developed our aid data 
analytics platform that I'm going hope to show at the uh, Canadian Open Data Summit. And there you can find visualized open data of over 1 million projects and uh, 1,200 plus organizations who, who have published that type of data, all uh, concerning international development aid and from a worldwide audience. So I hope to explore that with you uh, during the summit. Fantastic 30 second elevator pitch. That's, <laughs> that's like textbook right there. You just taught a lesson. Now, do you want to take a little bit more time uh, to talk about uh, the summit, your, your session itself and go into more details? Or do you want to take questions from the audience or anything along those lines? Um, yeah, I could uh, share my screen to show the, the portal that we've been working on. Uh, but I'm, I'm a bit curious because I'm new to the Canadian community, right? So for me, I, I've been around in Europe. So I have no idea what you guys are doing in, in terms of open data and what it is uh, yeah, related to. Am I the only one in the international aid uh, sector? Is all the other stuff different? So, so that would be interesting for me to get an idea. The well, I'm gonna ask uh, people if you know, feel free to unmute yourselves and answer directly to Micah if you'd like. I know that uh, Canada is very heavily involved in the international landscape for when it comes to open government and open data, particularly with an organization called Open North uh, that's garnered some attention. But I'd like for, for others uh, to speak on it. I know Jeff Zakabe is here and he's, he's very heavily involved with a, a standard called. Oh, shoot, Jeff, remind me, XML, no, that's not XML. Uh, ah, anyways, I'm just chumming the waters a little bit for, for Micah here, if anyone else would like to say something. Um, I have actually registered uh, more interest in um, aid data uh, recently uh, through my own channels mm -hmm. because of what's happening in Afghanistan. Uh, I, yeah. I feel like uh, some people are wondering, well, how much did we put into this? Uh, how are we going to help people in future? Uh, who is doing the helping and, and all that sort of thing? I, I think it's going to put a spotlight on questions of this kind. And so uh, I think your presentation will be very welcome in particular. And I look forward to uh, telling people uh, in specific audiences about it. Well, great. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, humanitarian aid uh, response is, is, is another more, even more specific element of international uh, development, because then it's required to, you know, respond within uh, 24 hours if you really want to do something about emergencies. Um, the, the, there is some data of, of that kind, but there's also the, the longer efforts, you know, that might even take uh, three, five years to slowly change education levels or health, access to health, access to women's rights. I mean, all those kind of projects. Yeah, so diverse. Okay, I don't want to take up more time now. Let me just briefly share the screen. I hope it works. It, are you seeing my screen right now? Yeah. Yeah. You you just a couple more minutes just as an FYI. Yeah, so this is the platform. Uh, as you can see, uh, it collects a lot of, it, this is a summary of the whole data set of all the publishers that published according to the International Aid Transparency Initiative Standard. And then there's a whole list of uh, publishers. I can look for a, a, one, rela yeah, Global Affairs Canada. That's probably one you know. If I click on that one, yeah, they actually say that they, they have a lot of projects in Canada, which is not completely correct, of course, because they probably also, they are based in Canada, but most of their effort, of course, is in other countries. Well, if we click on this one, uh, oh, somehow it's not working right here. Well, maybe this. Why is it not working to click on this one? Okay, let's yeah. choose another one. Uh, oh, it's always like that. When you want to show something live, it doesn't. Um, so unclick. Maybe there's another Canada-linked uh, publisher. No, well, let's do USAID. Your neighbor, see if they appear. No, I do Oxfam. 
well, basically you can look up different organizations and then uh, click on a country, say Egypt, look at all the activities there. You see the status, implementation, you can look at the project details, basic information, financials, uh, budget flows, summary of the performance indicators. Well, in this case, they don't have any, but some of them have. Uh, so yeah, very quick. That's what the platform does. It helps you to explore this huge data set. And there's even more specific filters in this section, particularly also related to some of the stuff that uh, uh, Richard was mentioning, humanitarian. So if you're interested, you know, you click on this one and then you will find any activity that is actually linked to a humanitarian. I think it's, I still have some Canada filter on. So now it shows again the Global Affairs Canada. So, um, because actually the reset button is underneath the, the, the Zoom, <laughs> so I can't reset oh. now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but wow. anyway, yeah. Thank if you very you... much. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, I apologize. Yeah, I Micah. think that's it. Yeah. 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 yeah we're, we're definitely getting a tight on time here. It's fantastic. Uh, a tool that you have. We now need to move on to our next presenter, which is uh, Viet Ka. Uh, Viet Ka, I believe, is the correct pronunciation of his last name. So Viet, if you would be so kind to either turn on your camera, trigger the camera uh, from Zoom, and uh, do your 30-second elevator pitch about your presentation. So uh, Viet, you're, uh, you're with us here? Yes, uh, uh, I hope that you, you can hear me well and see me well too. So I'm Viet Kao. I'm uh, in Canada uh, working for Synapse, which is an NGO that dedicated to data valorization in arts and culture. Uh, the proposition for the data summit, uh, Open Data Summit, uh, was about uh, data partnerships, actually how a data partnerships, which are lots of practices emerging. We have data collectives, data commons, data trust, how uh, those different forms of data sharing can lead to open data. And conversely, I wanted to talk about how open data by its uh, standards can also inform what type of right partnerships uh, could be uh, ideal depending on the objective you could have, whether at the individual or societal uh, level. So really my uh, communication will be about those, those forms of data valorization uh, for a, a purpose, if you already know it, or if you don't know it, how uh, either partnerships or open data can actually uh, be a, a way, a process to explore it. So that was perfect. Thank you so much, Viet, for, for that sort of 30 second elevator pitch. But you want to take a couple more minutes to go uh, more in depth into your presentation? Uh, do you have any uh, slides to share also? Uh, yes, uh, I have to prepare some uh, accordingly to your instructions. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I've made you co-host. Great. Let me just make a few clicks. So um, really, the, the, the main outline is about data as information assets to be really leveraged and shared. And um, the value of data really lies in the actual use of data, not the fact to have it, but to actually do something with it. And uh, usually it's um, once data can be used just for oneself, but can be used for others. So data can be used in their multiple ways. And that's why there, uh, there is a perception of a lot of potential, but how to achieve and realize that potential. And uh, also data has even more value on, or can reach full potential when linked or compared to other data. That's why it's uh, so interesting <laughs> and interesting topic. And uh, data partnerships types can answer different uh, organizational business or society needs and also lead to open data. But the problem is, is which data to open or not is the process to open it worth the, the trouble, kind of. There's a lots of data. We live in, a, in an era of uh, infobesity, kind of. And uh, do I just share it, open it? Do we, do we already know the objective or not? And sometimes uh, we don't know how data can be useful, but others have more vision than ourselves. Conversely, uh, open data sets a lot of principle. There is uh, some words not to be reinvented and standards to, to, to adhere or to comply to, and which, which really helps in defining the right partnerships and how it, 
right uh, level of openness that I can achieve so that it, it is beneficial for both one third, but more to, to others. And uh, really uh, the, the value of data then if we circle back is really can be maybe measured by the process of sharing or open it. Uh, data has more value when spread it out and in the most way in the possible for the, the beneficial uh, and the benefit of uh, most people. Okay, uh, so we are, it, Maybe 30 seconds more, but that's about it. Uh, actually, I, I was done. I haven't prepared, so, so I, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't um, tell too much about what I will be <laughs> using about. It's just a teaser, not the full movie. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Viet. That's that's great. Um, would you be so kind as of to stop sharing your screen? Because sure. next we are moving on to Eugene Chen. Uh, Eugene Chen. Uh, Trigger the camera, turn on the camera for Zoom. And um, uh, once again, like I said, clip or say something and then do go into your 30 second uh, elevator pitch. Eugene, if you're speaking, you are muted. Um, you, can you hear me? We can hear you, but we cannot see you. Uh, can you see the screen? I can see the screen share, yes. Uh, sorry, my video is not quite working, so I'm not going to try and mess it up because it, uh, it messes with the audio. So I'm just going to do the screen instead. That that works. There's something to see. You don't sure. have to see my face anymore. It's all, it's all good. Okay. The presentation is uh, much, much uh, prettier. OK, so first, let's do the 30-second elevator pitch and then uh, go into more details. OK. Hi, my name is Eugene, and I'm going to be giving a couple of talks at the summit. Um, the first one is visualizations that blew my mind and will hopefully inspire you. Uh, my background is data visualization. In this teaser, only enough time to just show you just one, but this is one of my favorites and really simple. We all have line charts. Line charts are hard to try and make nice, but uh, Gladys actually has managed to turn simple line charts to illustrations that look really pretty. And she's done a whole bunch. I'll go into more detail on the other one. Um, th this one is about more practical things on how to help you to get your data more, um, uh, how to get people to get excited about your data, around clar techniques around clarity, engagement. And um, yeah, I think that's it. OK, thank you for the 30 seconds. <sighs> Sorry, that was not 30 seconds. Ah. Oh, no, it was good. It was good. You're, you're a natural. Don't, don't fret. <laughs> uh, but is there anything else in more details you'd like to share with the group? Uh, sure. Um, I, I guess I had a five minute that was preparing for, but I'm going to just cut it down to uh, less than that because obviously we don't have the time for that. Um, but I will try and zoom through this as quickly as I can. Um, can you still see my screen? Yes, sir. All right. I think this is the five minute one. Uh, or if it's shorter. All right. I'll get started then. Um, so uh, I'm going in this quick presentation, I'm going to go through a bit of my background and some overview of my talks. Just a bit background of me I'm with the Canadian Open Data Society, uh, one of the board members. I come from Edmonton, Alberta. And I also am the co-chair of the Civic Tech Group here. My day job, it's around visualization. And I create things like baby name visualizations, uh, a tool that helps people connect across different, uh, around the world at a time that works, just using city names instead of time zones, economic data to track for COVID impact, visualization on property assessments and comparing them dy dynamically. And uh, this is a project around social mobility with 800 million data points uh, to cover 30 million Americans across the years. There's a lot more, um, but in short, my work is again in visualization. My work's been covered through the CBC, NPR, New York Times. And uh, yeah, that's that. So visualization is a lot of what, what I do. I hope that some of the ones that I've seen through conferences and whatnot will inspire you. 
Um, one of the most interesting ones that I know of is line charts. This line Actually, chart I'm going to stop you right there, sorry. Eugene. Yeah. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to stop you right there because I just noticed that we have Alessandro that joined us and uh, Chantal that joined us. So sure. we're really tight on time. We want to give equal time to everyone. Sure. So uh, thank you so much, Eugene. We'll definitely publish that information as part of the promo. Sounds good. And uh, because we told people that we would go in an alphabetical order, I'm going to double back and uh, ask Alessandro, who is, um, once again, let me put up my, let me put up my notes, so with Statistics with Stats Canada, to uh, do your 30 second uh, elevator pitch and then get into a little bit more details about your presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm actually here instead of uh, Bianca uh, Ellison, so it should be a B, uh, <laughs> the, the the initial. But uh, anyway, uh, um, we are going to do a presentation on uh, our initiative called Linkable Open Data Environment. Uh, that is the plan. I don't have any visual. Uh, there is quite a lot of material online uh, so that the initiative is going on for about a couple of years now, but we are, uh, have made substantial progresses with new databases. The major one has been the open database of addresses, about 10 million addresses uh, across Canada. And that was also with a collaboration with open addresses. Uh, and then we created a mapping uh, application, uh, LODE viewer, uh, and we will uh, present that and some development uh, with that. We are also you know, starting to think a bit more seriously on, on, on the analytics that uh, we can generate with this open data. We've done project with students. We've done a proximity measure with open data. There will be some of that in the presentation. Uh, and uh, we are doing some more cool uh, stuff uh, with uh, street view imagery and the process of uh, image uh, processing. I'm not sure that will fit into the presentation, but we might have some of that because that's part of our open data uh, development. And uh, I stop here again. Sorry for not having any any visual. Uh, we can certainly share something as B, as soon as Bianca is back from vacation. That will be August thirty. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandro, for sharing. Uh, a few uh, can I can I say a final final? I should have said that at the very beginning. Um, you know, we should be able to attend participate. I'm still waiting for the final okay because we are, you know, we are in the pre-election uh, period. Uh, there should be no issue. We are a statistical agency. There's uh, you know, an initiative that has been going on, but uh, again, I'm, I'm still waiting for the very final okay uh, to make sure that we can attend as a speaker at this conference. Thank you. Yeah, that snap election threw a, a curveball for a lot of people, didn't it? But uh, thank you, Alessandro. The next person we're going to go to, the next person we're going to go to is Steve Chaika. So Steve, uh, if you kindly turn on your camera, if you'd like, and uh, do your 30 second elevator pitch, trigger the Zoom camera so this we can record it and take it over, take it off. All right, thank you. Um, so just give me a second to set up here. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Chaika. I'm the manager of the Smart City Program at the city of Mississauga. And I'm gonna take you on a journey. This journey is the data roadmap for Canada. And we're gonna start our journey with open data. And then we're gonna take a little detour that probably most cities across Canada with some exceptions have kind of missed out on in that journey, that detour is called data governance. And then we're gonna take you on, a, on another destination which is the need for global data standards. We're gonna talk about data trusts. We're gonna talk about policies and laws. And specifically, I'm gonna focus on something we're working at at Mississauga called the Smart City Policy. And then we're gonna talk about um, blockchain as an underlying foundation of trust and then why this is so important. And why is data support important? It's important for the survival of the human race. And I'm, and I'm gonna get us there in this presentation in, in, tw in 20 minutes or so. We're talking about things like climate change. Um, local data sets and even personal data sets are so important um, to solving major issues like climate change and so many other problems that our, that our society faces. 
And so the final destination we're going to land on is a data-driven country and innovation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Steve. Um, do you have any shares, to, uh, any slides to share or anything along those lines? For the next yes, minute so, so we do have, um, I'm going to see if I can share here. Just click on the sharing screen. Give me one second, here we go. And instead of sharing slides with you, I am gonna share with you our Smart City website and hopefully everybody can see that. And, um, and so now I can go through a little more detail with the, the presentation itself. So like I mentioned before, we're gonna start with, we're gonna start our journey on open data. And we're gonna particularly talk about the status of open data across Canada. We're gonna look at some more advanced things like federated open data, open data at scale is one of the things we're calling it. And we're gonna look at some case studies. Uh, City of Edmonton is doing a wonderful job on open data. Toronto Police even is doing a great job on open data as well. And a couple of other uh, case studies that we're gonna get into. And as I mentioned, we're gonna to detour to data governance. This is probably something that most cities, including Mississauga, have not um, focused on, perhaps is a good way of putting it. And it's something we need to focus on. Probably should have been the first thing most cities should have done before everything else. And so we're kind of backtracking, we're kind of detouring on this just a bit. So things like data catalog, data classification, quality, master data management, and so on. Of course, we're gonna talk about the, the policy. And so the smart city policy and, and Mississauga is planning to share this policy with every city across Canada who can choose to employ it or not. And we're working with Dr. Ann Kavukian on this. So we'll be talking more about that in the presentation. We're also gonna be looking at a unified data platform. So some way of bringing our 300 production level databases into one place and be able to manage that easily. We're gonna be talking about the concept of a unique Canadian digital identity, one identity that's shared across all applications. We're gonna be talking about data standards and the need for industry data models, the need for global comparisons. We're gonna be talking about just briefly unified analytics consistency between analytics. Uh, we're gonna talk about laws, real data laws, um, data trusts, and some of the work that Estonia and Finland is working on. And then we're gonna talk about a Canadian case study of that called Innovate Cities. And then we're also gonna be focusing on blockchain as a, as a foundation of trust, which is greatly lacking in society today. And we're gonna look at Estonia for that as a case study. Mostly. Moving along to our destination, of a data-driven culture. Uh, my apologies, Steve, sorry. We do need to move on. This looks like a fantastic session. I love that Mississauga is getting into the, the fold of things. And I can't help but notice that the new Mississauga logo or appears like the MetaMask logo a little bit. You mentioned blockchain. Um, so, so thank you so much, Steve. We'll definitely make sure to promote your session. Awesome. Next. We're going to have Nick Farnell from Niagara College. Nick, if you would be so kind to uh, turn on your camera, camera if you'd like, and trigger the Zoom camera by making a noise of some kind, and to give us your 30-second elevator pitch, and then we'll go into more details. There we go. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, good stuff. Uh, so my name is Nick Farnell. I'm a faculty member in the School of Business at Niagara College. Um, I spend most of my time building workshops and building tutorials for, for data projects. And in this specific workshop, I'm get, going to be using R in our studio to collect, access, and visualize open data, specifically trying to answer the question, is there a relationship between the ratings of elementary schools and the characteristics of the neighborhoods that they're in? That's, That's my, my 30 second. I do have a, a slide deck that I'll, I'll go through quickly. Uh, how do I share screens here? You should see a bottom. Uh, uh, actually, uh, maybe I can make you co-host. Already but, done. Already done. Yeah, you should see a button on the bottom called share screen. In green. Yeah. Uh, can everybody see that now? Maybe, maybe not. I only see you. Sometimes you got to, if you have multiple monitors, there you go. Is that good? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, so I'll go through this one really quickly. Um, again, this is R and open data um, using R for analysis, but specifically R and R, R libraries to access open data, collect 
data that might be less than open and analyze it. Uh, specifically, like I said, using uh, ratings of elementary schools mm -hmm. and Stats Canada data, tying them together to see if there's any um, relationships there and then visualizing it. The first question that we're going to go over, is there a relationship? Deciding what to measure, how we're gonna measure it. So looking at things like how many schools are there? Is there existing rating systems in place? Um, how, do you, how do you define a neighborhood? So these kinds of questions that we'll, we'll go over, collect the data specifically using, um, we'll, we'll do some web scraping to pull the addresses and rankings from the Fraser data uh, our Fraser Rankings website, and then we'll use Stats Canada data uh, for neighborhood information. We'll collect that data, refine it a little bit, create some visualizations, and, and try to understand these relationships. And of course, share the insights. So merging these two really different data sets together, uh, we'll join them by dissemination area and then kind of visualize that data. Um, looking for any correlation between these variables. And again, you know, putting it out visually to, to kind of get there. Um, my, my question to you, is there anything that I'm missing? This, this is more of kind of a, a workshop rather than um, a discussion. And I'll admit there are probably some easier ways to get to the, the answer of the question. But like I said, I spend most of my time kind of teaching people the tools and technologies. So taking that sometimes wider path to get to an answer um, is, is useful in being able to explore some of these technologies. Well, that's wonderful. And uh, unfortunately we are pressed for time. So I kindly urge that everyone that would like to speak with Nick directly about what he's missing to reach out to him. Nick, would you like to maybe say what your email address is or put it into the uh, chat box so people yes. can see that way? Um, so it's just N Farnell, I don't know if anybody can see this. Uh, N-F-A-R-N-E-L-L -L at niagaracollege.ca. Do you also mind dropping it into the chat just in case? Sure thing. Wonderful. Um, you want to, oh yes. So I'm going to, okay. Wonderful. Next, on, on, je vais l'introduire en français parce que je pense qu'elle est francophone. Uh, notre prochaine présenteur, c'est Chantal Goyette de l'Immigration, Citizenship and Refugees Canada. Uh, Chantal, si tu veux prendre ton, uh, ton 30 secondes pour faire uh, ton elevator pitch, tu peux le faire en français si tu veux, c'est pas de problème avec nous. Et uh, si tu veux expliquer ta session en français ou en anglais, c'est ton choix. OK, Chantal, t'es là? Parfait. Okay. Oui, je suis là. Merci. Bonjour. Bonjour, Richard. Bonjour, tout le monde. Alors, mon nom est Chantal Goyette, je suis la directrice du développement des données et des rapports à Immigration, Réfugiés, Citoyenneté Canada. Um, similarly to Viet's presentation, we will highlight how IRCC's strategic data partnership enhances the value and the use of IRCC data asset, and how these enhanced data are then available for all Canadians. So the presentation will really focus about enhancing the data and making it uh, available to a broader community after. So voilà. Merci. Un super bon de 30 secondes elevator pitch. Est-ce que, est que tu as des, um, des slides ou des choses comme ça que tu veux démontrer ou aller en plus détail? J'en ai, mais malheureusement, j'ai des problèmes techniques parce que j'ai pas accès à Zoom au travail. Donc, il va falloir travailler là-dessus aussi pour la présentation. Donc, j'ai quand même des notes que je peux vous lire, mais je pense que je ne peux juste pas les projeter, mais euh, on pourra travailler pour voir pour la présentation comment on va faire euh, euh, pour, pour pouvoir projeter. Ça okay. va? Ça va, absolument. OK. So, IRCC. Allez-y. OK. IRCC is a, uh, a data-driven department with broad and administrative data sources, ranging from immigration application, immigrant, also to citizenship acquisition and passport, for example. So uh, in this presentation, we will um, go through how the department uh, is repurposing the data, how we enhance the value and the use of uh, the data by leveraging key strategic partnership with the objective to grow data assets for the benefits of all Canadians. 
we will present how we are repurposing the data. So what do we mean by repurposing data? Uh, it's moving the data from an administrative data into something more insightful. So that's what we mean. So we will go through these steps. We will also present IRCC's Chief Data Officer's branch role in producing research-ready data, performing a a spectrum of work to leverage IRCC data asset through information sharing agreement with Statistics Canada and provincial partners to provide greater value <laughs> and use for the data. We will also present how we make such enhanced data available and accessible. This includes making data available on the open data portal. So we have established and uh, are maintaining comprehensive inventories of data and information resources of business value to, to be released regularly on the open data portal. And we are also constantly growing this inventory of data sets. So we'll be talking about some of this and IRCC is among the departments uh, at the federal level who has the most uh, hits in terms of its uh, table being downloaded. And there's also, um, it will also include presenting all the micro level data that we make accessible in a secure environment at over 30 university campuses across the country. So that is also, so part of our presentation. And lastly, we will share with the audience some of our key lessons learned for growing data assets through key data uh, partnership. So voila. And this presentation will be bilingual, of course, but today's presentation, we just went with an English, uh, you know, pitch. Voila. Merci. Merci bien, Chantal. Et, et ça va être fun d'entendre de, tout ça. Et Chantal a la raison. Comme j'ai dit au début, or like I was saying at the very beginning, this is going to be a bilingual summit. So some sessions will be fully bilingual and Franglais style, a little bit like what we're doing right now. And other ones will be fully French. Other ones might be solely in English. Um, so thank you, Chantal, for sharing with us today. Uh, next is Chris Harrison with the city of Edmonton. So Chris, I see that your camera is already up. So if you'd like to trigger and get into your uh, 30 second, that'd be wonderful. Hi, I'm Chris Harrison. I'm the Open Data Guy with the City of Edmonton. Um, the presentation that I'll be doing is regarding um, the user friendliness of our Open Data program. Um, so the, the City of Edmonton has been considered by the Public Sector Digest to be North America's most open city since 2015. We have thousands of assets, um, just shy of 3,000 assets, wherever possible it's raw, unmolested data. It, it's great for people like Eugene Chen, but is it usable for the normal everyday person on the street? Um, so the presentation will look into who our users might be and uh, includes a case study about um, some difficulties that uh, normal everyday citizens might have in actually making use of some of the data that we publish. It's perfect. That's a great 30 seconds right there. And again, much like I'm asking everyone else, is there more details or slides that you'd like to share with the group? There's no point in me really showing any slides um, at this time, but um, the, the main case study that I'll be exploring is regarding our councillor voting record. Um, so we do publish um, a number of data sets regarding council meetings and agenda items and motions, and ultimately how, how each councillor voted. Um, but you have to join together so many different data sets you'd have to spin up a, a local database, create some tables, um, scrape all the data. There's, there's APIs, but you have to page through because there's so many rows. Then you'd have to write um, queries to join this all together, um, ultimately to just be able to see how your councillor voted on an issue that is of interest to you. Um, so yeah, again, it's, it's great for people like Eugene, but for, for this, the normal person on the street, it's completely inaccessible. Um, so what can we do to try and improve that situation? Well, that's wonderful. And, and making things more accessible for a larger audience, which is actually um, some of the themes, or there's two themes to the Open Data Summit, uh, responsible data governance and engagement and digital literacy. So um, very, very on topic for this, this summit. So thank you, Chris, for sharing with us a few thoughts about your presentation. The next person uh, I'm going to ask to come on, and his camera is already on, is uh, Rudvig, Rudvig Rana from the city of Calgary. Uh, so Rudvig, if you could turn on your mic, trigger the camera, and get into the 30-second elevator pitch, that'd be appreciated. 
All right. All right. Sounds good. Let me just just let me know if I'm it's triggered and let me know if I'm on the screen. OK, perfect. Sounds good. So, hey, everyone, my name's uh, Rit Bajrana and I'm here from the city of Calgary. I'm an open data strategist. Um, unfortunately, my uh, co uh, presenters, uh, Yanush Gower and uh, Yanush Gower from the city of Calgary and Deanna Campbell from Alberta Health Services are unfortunately unable to attend today. Um, but our presentation will be focusing on enabling public access to information and wayfinding to book vaccinations for COVID-19 and more so just providing public access to people so that, like Chris mentioned, so that the average Joe can sort of go about it and actually use this data. Um, so the City of Calgary, in partnership with members of Alberta Health Services, um, has been able to provide access to COVID-19 vaccination uh, clinic locations. Um, and this has actually enabled efficient public access to that information. And this data has been sourced from uh, Alberta Health Services as well as Alberta Pharmacies and can be accessed from the City of Calgary's open data portal by a public transit app. And this has allowed citizens to sort of use their mobile devices um, to book their COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, and the transit app has actually been enabling citizens to view locations, uh, vaccine types, uh, accessing direct booking links, all while identifying options to commute via transit. And this is super important because uh, publicly available data um, has usually not been as inclusive, um, but in this case, it is inclusive just because it allows Calgarians without access to personal vehicles um, uh, access some of these locations, as well as contribute to the sort of increase in vaccination rates within um, the city of Calgary. So all in all, th this presentation will be in and around uh, enabling access to the public um, of, of data and of different information across the city. Thank you That's very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Rudvich. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to share slide-wise for the next minute or two? I, I don't have any slides, but uh, would I be able to share my screen quickly? Of course. All right. All right, just let me know if you're able to see my screen. Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. So I'll just quickly show you um, what we have in terms of visualization for some of these COVID-19 vaccination locations um, that again, we'll use uh, to show how we can enable uh, public access to information. Um, some of these are just different points on a map. Uh, it basically just shows uh, if you click on a point, it'll just show the address of the location, um, the data available for these different vaccines, and it'll show the vaccine types, either vaccine type one or vaccine type two. In this case, it doesn't have one. Um, and it also show various information if it's uh, this walk-in type of thing is available um, or not. If it's true, it's available. If not, it isn't. Um, and then just uh, just on the right-hand side, you can actually filter through various different um, uh, vaccine locations and different types or uh, um, uh, the dates available uh, where these vaccines are in. And uh, through this, actually, uh, this is actually our base foundational piece. And because of this, our uh, data is actually integrated to the transit app and various other real-time apps as well um, that citizens of Calgary are able to use. Um, so yeah, that's just a little quick, quick little briefer um, on, on uh, or teaser on uh, what this presentation will potentially be about. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Redvidge. And uh, just sort of speaking, uh, to you directly here. I think we we are like-minded individuals. I can't help but see that you're a Raptors fan. I too have the Lego Saturn V like all built up in the background and which is an athletic sword. So uh, if you want to talk yes. sports, I'll be more than happy to do that with you, buddy. <laughs> um, so next, and I believe this might be our last uh, presenter today, unless uh, Paul, I'm going to ask you to confirm, but we have Jess Rea here. Looks like it. That's going to be it. That was going to be Jess. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So uh, Jess Rea, if you are here, if you could turn on your camera and uh, trigger the Zoom recording camera as well and go into your 30 second elevator pitch, that'd be wonderful. Bonjour. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I'm Jess Rea, Assistant Professor of Data Science at the University of Virginia and a member of the Montreal 2424 First Night Council in Montreal. And my pitch is for the need to develop open data policies for the 24-hour city, having in mind the nightlife ecosystem when designing and implementing data policies, repositories, and charters, for example. And I focus mainly on Montreal and its effort to create a nighttime policy 
uh, during a pandemic, while also establishing a social data, social data hub and a digital data charter. And some of you may not know, but Night Studies is a transdisciplinary emergent area and has been receiving increasing attention with more than 50 cities worldwide adopting governance mechanisms such as Nightmares, and Montreal is one of them. We also have Toronto here in Canada, and open data is a crucial part of this context and this process. So that's it. Thank you so much for the elevator pitch. And again, just like everyone else, do you have anything to share with us? You'd like to go into more details or anything along those lines? I can quickly share the ecosystem so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. When I talk about, uh, can you see it? Um, yeah. Here it is. Uh, so this is like a preliminary sort of ecosystem because when I talk about nightlife and nighttime economy, usually we think about like bars, nightclubs, culture, but you also have like a very complex ecosystem, a complex uh, regulatory framework as well. So we have everything like from governance and open data to lightning, noise, uh, governance, all sorts of public transit and uh, other kinds of ride sharing apps, hospitals, everything that takes place overnight, labor. So it's like quite complex and you have like all these stakeholders in the ecosystem and there's a lack of open data policy data repositories and this has become like an issue here in Montreal and in many other cities it's one of the things that we talk the most about lately and especially if the pandemic if you want to relaunch the economy of municipal governments and everything like we really need to know like what's going on and the size and the structure of nightlife in the cities and all the stakeholders so the goal is to present a little bit of uh, what I've been doing here in Montreal over the last two years at my university. Uh, here's an idea of all the cities that had adopted uh, some kind of nightlife governance here. And we'll talk about like how this relates to all the open data policies and the needs and the problems we are facing here in Montreal and trying to map and understand the kind of information we have to really like have this kind of uh, 24 hour city here. So thanks. Wow. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, uh, again, it's a branding. I'm a marketer, I think, by trade. And yeah, nightlife, I think going out to the bar, never really looked at it in that perspective. And my mind is officially blown. Um, so nicely done, Jess. And uh, nicely done for everyone who shared their perspectives and shared their presentations uh, for the summit and doing the 30 second elevator pitch. I do have uh, a bit of time to, for questions and answers for, for, for the other, for anyone who may not be presenting that want to ask a specific question to a presenter or even within the presenter community, if you have a question for one of your colleagues, uh, the floor is open. All right, the floor is closed unless people are still uh, just a little too shy about asking questions on Zoom. So uh, with all that said, um, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Paul Connor, qui va dire un couple de mots pour uh, fermer la, la session aujourd'hui à propos de l'organisation. Puis moi je vais faire, uh, and I'm gonna do my own closing at the very end if that's okay with you, Paul. Absolutely. So, uh... Yes, uh, this is my pitch uh, regarding the Canadian Open Data Society. We've been in operation like less than a year. We're um, about two months away from our first anniversary. And yet we've been able to maintain a very steady pace of educational uh, content, uh, of uh, meetings and uh, events. Uh, we have formed an advocacy committee, which is um, really uh, where we find our uh, advocates in the community who uh, want to get involved and uh, and sort of bring them on board with the whole situation, but also address the burning issues. And we want to hear from everybody uh, about what they think burning issues are in open data, whether it's uh, publication or platforms or standards or whatever. We can lend our voice. We can lend our uh, organizational uh, uh, <laughs> heft, if you will, to uh, to the effort and uh, and hopefully uh, make Canada, uh, as I was saying uh, at the outset, or as my slide said, to be exact, make Canada an open data society. Um, supporters, uh, if you just sign up and give us your email, you'll uh, get our mailings uh, and uh, you will get discounts uh, to our, our paid events. If you are a member 
uh, you have the chance to vote on and participate in our board and committee and annual general meetings. Uh, sneak preview, our first annual general meeting will be September 22nd. We were gonna have it earlier, but you know, election. Uh, and there are seats available uh, for the board. Uh, we are having a bit of planned turnover. And um, we also have organizational memberships, which uh, municipalities, nonprofits, universities, and anybody else are, are more than welcome to. And, and we can give them extra special uh, love and support in, in that case. And actually, I should correct this slide. If you join before October 2021, you will be forever recognized as a founding member of the society because it will have been in the first year of our operation. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Richard. And thank you, Paul. Merci, Paul. And merci à tous les présentateurs aujourd'hui et de partager leur, uh, uh, leur, uh, leur sneak peek. Um, the event is taking place, like I said, September 14th to 15th, sorry, 15th to 16th. Yep. And uh, you can still sign up. Uh, with the early bird, uh, the early bird fee until oh shoot no that might have changed. Actually, yeah. yep, that's over. But if you're a member, uh, that early bird uh, rate is uh, permanent. There you go. And so, um, with all that said, I don't believe there's any more questions. But if you do have, as particularly I'm speaking to the presenters here, if you have the, any questions, technical in nature, requests. Uh, for the content on the website or whatever, don't hesitate to reach out to Paul or myself and we'll do our best to accommodate you. And if so, if there's nothing else, um, I'd like to share with you a, a closing for online webinars that I've been doing for the last a little while. It's a, it's a closing that I decided to adopt from Count Bassey, who is an old timey jazz musician and he used to do this to close out his sessions and it goes like this. Well, this, ladies and gentlemen, just about winds up our little session. For all the gang and myself, we sincerely hope you've enjoyed us as much as we've enjoyed working for you. It's been swell. And you did just wonderful again. And thanks a million again. And invite us again, back again soon. So until we meet again, good evening.